Hi everyone, this is Mari Craig and you're listening to the Small Steps to Wellness show, a podcast where we discuss how we can achieve more wellness in our lives one small step at a time. For the past six odd years, I've taken a special interest in nutrition and I've changed the diet of my family on its head. But as I've dived deeper into the world of nutrition, I have learned that health is so much more than just what we put on our plate. This is why on this podcast, we will be talking nutrition, mental health, being in alignment, holistic health care, self-care, raising children and more. We will also be hearing stories of women's journeys to overcome trauma and what it has taught them on the way. When we share our stories, we realise we are not alone and that things can change for the better. I'm so glad to have you with me on this journey as I explore what health and wellness truly encompass. If you like what you're hearing, please consider rating the show with a five star rating and sharing it with your friends. It really makes a big difference. Now, on with today's show. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Small Steps to Wellness show with me, your host, Mari Craig, where we are discussing how we can achieve more wellness in our lives one small step at a time. Now, a few years ago, probably five, six years ago, before I had really understood the connection between food and health, my mother-in-law told me she got a book from the book people uh, when they were still around, when they'd come to her work. And it was a book by someone who called themselves a medicinal chef. And she thought I'd like it because I had started dipping my toes into changing my diet, but I didn't really know that much. And But interestingly, I've got a book in front of me for those who are watching on YouTube. Um, but little did she or I know what this book would lead to for me, because from thinking that being slim was way forward and what I had to do was eat less and move more, the book taught me that it's what I eat that matters and that I can actually help my health through what I choose to put into my mouth. And the author of this book uh, was none other than Del Pinnock, who I have with me on the show today. Um, Del Pinnock has dedicated the last 26 years of his life to the field of nutrition and helping people like you and me achieve better health. And nutrition really is such an incredibly powerful and effective tool in the management and prevention of disease. This is a biggie for me. Um, he's the Sunday Times bestselling author. I've got two of his books here. Look, this one, the Nutrition Bible, I use all the time. Uh, it's written 18 books. He's a clinical practitioner, TV presenter, teacher. Um, he has a, a BS uh, in human nutrition and in herbal medicine, and he's a postgraduate, um, has a postgraduate degree in nutritional medicine. But also, he is a creator of the Culinary Medicine College, of which I am one of the students. <sighs> I'm exhausted. Welcome, Dale. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having me. It's great. I mean, we, you know, we're both kind of here on like the hottest day on record. Yeah. It's. Uh... Plenty of plenty of the H two O. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yo, know, how how are we supposed to cope? Uh, uh, you know, on a day like this, from from your point of view, is it just drink water and stay in the shade, or is the there... drink water and have fun? Yeah, yeah, enjoy it. I mean, obviously, if you don't like being hot, then you know you're kind of in stuck. But yeah. you know, it's nice to have weather like this. I'm not really that bothered. I, I, I spend a lot of time in hot countries, so it doesn't yeah. it doesn't phase me a great deal. I've lived in some quite hot countries as well. I just wish we had aircon. I have to go and sit in the car to, to benefit from that. But you know what? It's nice to have it. Yeah, yeah. I, this is the thing. We're so we're masters of of complaining, aren't we? I, I blame it on being uh, being Norwegian that I just cannot cope with this weather because we never have it back where I'm from. <laughs> but uh, I guess uh, British Norwegian is, 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 is a lot of the same. What's going on in your life, uh, Adele? What are what are your sort of what are you working on at the moment? Well, I mean, obviously, you spoke there about the Culinary Medicine College, uh, just been working on a new site and just getting ready to take it to new heights, really, and take it to new places. I mean, currently got 1,100 students actively studying the course at the minute on every single continent, apart from Antarctica, but I'm working on it. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I just think it's it's ready to take it to a new place and to, to take it bigger and to, and to, you know, just help more people get access to this information, especially the people that actually want to put it into practice so they can go out there and change more lives. That's mm. ultimately what it is. So that, you know what, to be fair, that's taken up a lot of my time and I've been, I've been doing bits of brand work here and there. Uh, not really been doing much media stuff. 
Um, got some food festivals coming up. So we've got Chris Evans uh, Car Fest, awesome. which is the one in July and one in August. Uh, and they're fantastic. They've got uh, an amazing kitchen stage and they're, they're, they're doing wellness events within it as well. So I'm doing stuff on stage with the likes of Dr. Megan Rossi, um, Dr. Rongan Chatterjee, those kind of guys. You know, it's going to be a, a really good few days. That and that's about like it, really. Yeah, mm. but that sounds like an amazing summer. I was going to ask you about the um, a culinary medicine college, um, and kind of I I started studying because I wanted to have a paper that said I, I knew an awful lot of things that I could help people. But what 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 was your why? Why why did you start it? And what what's your main objective with it? The main thing, really. I mean, my I've I've always come from an evidence based background. I always had this very, very clear vision that if we're going to actually have longevity within the nutrition field, if we're actually going to be taken seriously, then we always need to be coming from an evidence base. Because if you look around, not so much now, I mean, like I've been doing this since the very early 90s. I mean, you, you said in the, the bio there, I figured it out this year, it's 30 years. Oh, gosh. 30 years I've been in this industry. And certainly in the 90s, there was a lot of woo-woo then. I mean, then it was all like, you know, coffee enemas and fruit fasts and all sorts of weird shit that, to be fair probably a lot of the people that were spouting that deserved the comeback that they got from it. But it really made a lot of people actually veer and demand an evidence-based uh, practice. So I've, I've always come from the very conventional training background. So with all of my education, I've got two BSCs, I've got a postgrad as well. I've not necessarily done some of the weird and wonderful things that were out there. But because I realised that there was, there was like the, this there was polar opposites in terms of the training that was available. It was crystal clear that something was missing for people that wanted to study something to like, that was evidence-based, they would have to go to university, which for some people is fine, but not everyone wants to go to university. Not everyone can dedicate three, four or five years if they're doing it part-time of their life to something like that. And it's blooming expensive, like nearly 10 grand a term to go to university now. So a lot of people are don't have that option. But for a long time, a lot of the, the kind of diplomas in nutrition were absolutely terrible. They were teaching really questionable practices. They weren't working from an evidence base. They had, there was nowhere near enough science in them to actually give people a really solid structured education in the subject so it was crystal clear that something was missing there in the middle so I set about to create it it just seemed like the most obvious thing one of my big passions is teaching you if, if you've ever, ever seen me talk or anyone that's ever seen me or heard me talk on the subject of nutrition especially when we're going down the rabbit holes I love it it animates me it brings me to life teaching this subject is my thing so to create a course was like you know a, a wonderful labor of love and i wanted to create something that could take anyone regardless of background through an academic journey and literally spit them out the other side with academic skills with the ability to do research with the ability to actually go and read a paper and uh, not not a paper like the sun or something like that to actually go and read a scientific paper and understand research but at the same time have enough practical knowledge on nutrition to be able to start working with clients and helping them to transform in a way that's safe and effective in you know 12 months or less if they wanted to do it full time or however long they take so i wanted to create that that was that was why i i had that vision of creating the culinary medicine college but then also i wanted to make sure that all of that science and all of that information was always delivered in the context of food Rather than just being like hours and hours of PowerPoint presentations about biochemical pathways and manipulation of biochemical pathways via supplementation protocols and stuff like that, which trust me, some of the courses are like that. Um, it just made sense to actually, if people are going to be working with clients on a day to day basis and helping them to change their diet and their lifestyle, then all of that science and all of that education needs to be placed within the context of food preparation so that people can actually deliver a framework that people can use to, to actually make those changes. So yeah, that was it. That's kind of why I decided to create it. So there, there is this middle of the road option for people that 
want a detailed and i mean you will be able to attest this course doesn't skimp on detail we no, really i was surprised at that i was like whoa i've got to fit in some effort here <laughs> <laughs> exactly and you know what i love it when i hear people say that because that's exactly what i wanted to achieve i wanted people to feel as confident in their abilities as they would if they'd gone and done a degree in a subject and i think a lot of people do and looking at what people are actually doing with the qualification kind of shines a light on that so wow. so yeah that was that was my my real why for doing it and now the, and also the beautiful thing is it's such a great option for people that might have been kind of priced out of the game and let's be honest I, I was quite lucky when I did my my first undergrad managed to get like the government funding and stuff that's when it was still like three and a half grand a year to go to university now it's 10 grand a year and it's very difficult to get that kind of funded but the beauty of the course that i've created because it's 100 percent online there's no overheads you know we have, we've not got to pay you know pay the gas bill in the office or anything like that so we can make it affordable for people as well and still operate as a business it's uh, you know it's 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 ticked so many boxes i think yeah, and I can tell you so passionate. You you were just saying you should hear me when I talk about nutrition, but I'm hearing you now. You're passionate about this. It's it's fantastic. This is I also get a bit wired when I when I talk about certain things, and mm -hmm. it, it's um, it's frustrating then when people don't get it. Just like, but this is important stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but what so. I, I love this idea that, so we do case studies in this course and we do then also recipe, de recipe development. Um, and that kind of leads me on to, I wanted to ask you, uh, what you see as the sort of biggest challenges we have in British society? I mean, maybe it's even Western society, Western Europe, European society. I'm not sure we're much worse in Norway where, I mean, I've been here 14 years in the UK, but, um, what are the challenges you're seeing? I mean, I have my views on it, but but why aren't we healthy? Why do people, why do we need somebody to help us uh, change our diet? What are we doing wrong? I think there's there's two things. There's there's two sides to this, and this is something that I think is very is a very British thing. Whether you whether I'd be able to use both arguments outside of the UK, I don't know. But certainly in this country, we've got we've got two things. First, and probably the biggest, is well, you know what I'm going to I'm going to say three actually, because there was something else has just kind of popped in, in, into my head, um, which I think you'll find is very true as well. I'm sure you've got to see this within British culture. But um, the two big things that I see, one is education. People are so confused because one of the things that happened with nutrition, and I, I always knew that nutrition was going to become something that was talked about a lot more and more widely understood and dare I say popular, but what I never really saw coming was how it was going to become weirdly entwined with popular culture and like kale would suddenly become aspirational. I mean, and I've, I was like, what kind of parallel universe are we in where that happened? But it has, and because it's been entwined with popular culture, it's in so many of the glossy magazines, there's always articles and content created about it, which aren't always the most accurate or reliable or can be based on old wives' tales and everything in between. And this creates a lot of grey areas for people. For the general public, I think they're confused. Even someone like me that's been in it for 30 years, there's still contradiction and dichotomy around every corner. So for the lay person to try and get their head around it, to try and really figure out what on earth to do, then... I feel for them because it's incredibly, incredibly complicated, but I will give a little tip there, right? Okay. If you look at all of these different diets, hundreds of different dietary approaches out there, keto, paleo, raw foodist, like plant-based, whatever, there's all of these different diets out there. Every single one of them reports these incredible health transformations. They always show these amazing before and afters and people say that they've reversed this condition. They've improved their blood pressure. They've lost weight, yada, yada, yada. All these things have improved yet the diets are so dramatically different to one another how can that be everyone's thinking about the differences there's one factor that unifies every single one of those diets and that is they're all leaving out the crap that makes us sick in the first place yeah. not one of these approaches turn around and be like yep fill up on processed food get like cheap seed oils in your diet use margarine stuff like that they're all promoting even though the macros are skewed 
in different ways. They're all promoting a whole foods diet. And that really is the key. Us just moving back to basics, just moving back to proper food again. That's going to solve a lot of problems. But that brings me on to point number two, food poverty, a massive issue at the minute. And with, you know, with all of the stuff that's going on with the cost, the cost of living crisis, it's going to only get worse because, I mean, some some people aren't even able to like have a light on or have they, you know, like in the in the colder months, have their heating on. And trust me, after the, the, the tariff change again in October, that's going to be even worse, especially moving into the winter. So even the cooking and, and preparation of certain food is going to be too taxing on some people's incomes. You know, I should make, you know, you and I actually, we're, we're, we're lucky. We don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. So it's very easy for us to turn around and think, oh, well, you should be eating this way or eating that way or doing this or doing that. But there's so many people that don't have that choice. And that is a problem that, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd love to have the answers to that. I mean, and let's, let's hope whichever of the Muppets gets in and um, <laughs> repla- replaces old Floppy Johnson, then they, they, can, they can figure it out. But I think a lot of people are quite stumped as to how to really get to the bottom of it. But all I would say is, like, in any given situation, just try your best to eat the best that you can. But you know what? If it's between starving or having something that's like a, you know, a ready meal or something like that, just eat what you can. And obviously there should never be any kind of self judgment from that respect, but I think that's a genuine problem. And it's, it's, it's a multifaceted problem that I don't think there's a, a quick and easy answer to, unfortunately. And then the third thing, the third thing that kind of popped into my head that I think is kind of a, a reflection of maybe like a a little sidebar of British culture. There's a proportion of society that just don't give a monkeys. This is the apathy. They're like, oh, I've got belly cow. I like my sausage roll from Greg's, and it's like, well, you crack on, mate. <laughs> so fair enough. If that's if 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 that's what what tickles your pickle, then great. But I mean, there there is definitely. Um, a proportion of the society in this country that's like, oh, no, I was telling me what to eat. Oh, okay. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> so so it's, it's an interesting picture. Mm, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. And, but this is also, I mean, I don't like people telling me what to do. I had to work this out for myself. You know, my husband doesn't like me telling him what to do, but if I drip feed it for long enough, he'll yeah. eventually come around and it's now the healthier person to me, you know. Yeah, I but hear you. There, there is one word that describes me perfectly. Recalcitrant. Right, right. Do you <laughs> Which means an absolute... explain that to the foreigner here? Yeah? Um, it means an absolute dislike and disdain for authority. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this is it. And I think, I think there's a lot to be said for that. And I wonder also whether whether on a sort of slightly more serious note the people who say i i could i couldn't you know care less um whether that also comes from the ridicule that nutrition is given or nutrition advice is given because i mean if we if we we don't and, and we don't need to go into details on this really but the one thing that really annoyed me uh, when we went into lockdown was the last month no March 2020 was that there was absolutely zero focus on what we could do nutritionally to help ourselves um build you know a strong immune system and when it was suggested by some people I I sort of tried to raise my voice a little bit on Facebook and was promptly shut down by my Facebook friends for even daring to suggest that the answer may be to eat more whole foods and more fruits and vegetables. So it's... uh... Yeah, that was, that was a weird time. I mean, it's quite, it's, um, I, uh, a couple of times I sort of spoke out about things, but I've, I've, I've been, I've had skin in this game for so long. I'm just too tired to be, you know, when everyone's kind, kind of, rattling off and going on like that i'm like Mm. i mean i'll just i'll just carry on with doing what i do and putting education out there and keeping it general but you know what i did write some stuff on uh you know vitamin d and covid and stuff like that and i referenced it and i didn't really get any kind of backlash i think i think it sort of depends like how if if you kind of look because there was definitely definite kind of trigger phrases for people so i sort of identified that quite early on it's like right if you just sort of deliver this information in the right way then it can maybe open a few eyes and a lot of people just found it fascinating information um because there was no i didn't even mention the vaccines didn't even mention 
antivirals, didn't even mention any other kind of interventions. It's just like, you know, there, there's some interesting research gathering momentum that shows a potential role of vitamin D in the whole in the whole picture of things. And just coming at it in that way. It's good language. Yeah. Yeah. And then well, that's that's it. And, and, that, and that's a real part of it. I, th- I think that's true for for anyone that, that is going to be active in the press and the media and doing a lot of things on social media. Mm. And very much like politicians as well. You need you need to kind of learn how to say stuff to be to have as minimal kind of inflammatory reaction as possible but still be able to sometimes navigate tricky subjects. Yeah, and get the message delivered at the same time. Yeah, yeah. no, it's, it's, a, yeah. It's, it's a minefield, but I think I think maybe that is that is where maybe it's a lot of people say, well, I'm not going to listen because uh, it's been it, people who are um, kind of talking about nutrition being important and food as medicine are being ridiculed because they've been kind of... People assume that they're saying instead of doing anything else, you should just be eating your, I don't know, kale <laughs> or taking a vitamin D supplement. So, so that's why, fire. that's why when you're giving that advice, you make it clear that that's not what you're saying. Exactly. Because, you know, yeah. a lot of people are stupid enough or maybe stupid is the wrong word, but are, and certainly, you know what, I think everyone's mental health took a bit of a, um, a, a kick to the pants during all of that situation because that was a very intensely alien situation for all of us to be in. So it was quite understandable that people would get irate about that kind of stuff. And we seem to be in a weird culture now where people are actually going out their way to look for things that they're offended by or that they don't like, or they even do like um, offense archaeology. So they go trawling through people's past just to try and find something that someone said 25 years ago um, to try and use against them. So there is a weird culture around that at the moment. And sometimes you have to spell this stuff out in such a way that what you write or what you say automatically addresses all of the potential question marks that you can see coming. Do you know what I mean? Exhausting. It is, yeah. Sometimes yeah. you think we just say, "Well, yeah, oh well, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just hit the explicit yeah. button on when I upload the podcast. So go for it. No, it, <laughs> it, it is, a, it, it, it is a tricky one. As I say to my children, I'm allowed to change my mind. I'm allowed to evolve as a person and have different opinions right. as I as I get older. But, but yeah, but it's um, but when everything is saved uh, for eternity on the world wide web, it's, it's it's a tricky one, isn't it? It is. Yeah, no, it's 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 been it's been interesting times. Um, one thing that I'm sort of trying to uh, get across at the moment, which I'm finding it a, a little bit tricky, is to get um away from this notion of of calorie counting. What are your views then after your not twenty six but thirty years in industry? <laughs> I thought we'd moved away from that now, but um, well. <sighs> It's like the gift that keeps on giving, isn't it? We've, uh, <laughs> we've 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 not found all of its horcruxes yet, so it refuses to die. Um, so, <laughs> you know what? I mean, I will stand by the statement that to lose weight, you need to use more calories than you store. Mm-hmm. That's a very different point of view from saying to lose weight, you need to eat less and move more. That's a very different stance. One is based on physiology. One is based on someone trying to simplify that physiological response. And you know what? If if you try and do more with your body and put less quality fuel in it, you're just going to get burnout. You're going to get you to feel overtrained. Your cortisol is going to go up. Your your immune system is going to suffer. You're going to be knackered. You're going to be ratty. You keep that up for you know, six or eight months, the women, their cycle is going to start going all over the place. Men, their testosterone level is going to plummet and nobody wants that in their life. Um, It, you know, it can have some very negative effects. And so many people are trying to do that, like dramatically lowering their, their, their calorie intake where the real messaging needs to be, let's understand the effect that different foods have in our body, the way that the body responds to that in order to maintain equilibrium and the knock-on effect that that has on weight gain and weight loss, okay? Now, 
if for, I mean, this is the bizarre thing. You can be potentially in a calorie deficit, as people always go on about this calorie deficit. And if you're just eating simple sugars, you'll still be laying down body fat. Now, you may be technically l- losing weight because you might actually be mo- you might actually be breaking down muscle tissue because your you know your your calorie intake is is so low, especially if it's a very low protein diet. So I'm just using an extreme example. I'm hoping no one's doing this, but I'm doing I'm giving an extreme example just to illustrate the point. Okay, so if you were like eating a diet that was maybe three four hundred calories below what your maintenance would be, and it happened to be a diet of white bread and potatoes, because of the sheer amount of glucose that's going to be going into your blood in a very short period of time, your body has to respond in a specific way, and the way that it responds will lead to more body fat being laid down the thing is when our blood glucose rises the body responds to it by releasing the hormone insulin insulin binds to an insulin receptor that then opens a doorway within our cells called a glucose transporter that allows glucose to enter that cell the cell can then use that glucose to manufacture adenosine triphosphate atp which is the fuel source that our energies run on although we can run on keto bodies as well but that's a different story um all great. The thing is, our cells have got a cutoff point. Our cells know when they've had enough glucose, or if they've got enough glucose present at at that time, because some of the structures, you know, things like our DNA, things like our mitochondria, some of the organelles, the structures within our cells are so susceptible to glucotoxicity, i.e. a toxic response when there's too much glucose present, that the cell has the ability to monitor what's going on and then shut the door when it's ready. When that door shuts, if blood glucose is still really high, then we've got a second way that we would deal with that. And this is what all happens over a very short period of time, by the way. The next thing that we'll do is we will store a little bit of that glucose within our skeletal muscle and within the liver in a form known as glycogen. Glycogen is a storage form of glucose that when our blood sugar levels get really, really low at whatever time, then the hormone glucagon will actually liberate some of that glycogen and we will use it in the same way as we use glucose. We'll just turn it back into the free glucose again. All great, but we can only store a little bit of glycogen at any one sitting. Now, if blood glucose is still high within that time period, then because blood glucose that's too high or too low are both potentially life-threatening states, that's why we've got these these um, the, these responses, these normal homeostatic control mechanisms. So if blood glucose starts dipping too low, we mobilize glycogen. It comes back up, problem solved. Then the flip side of that coin, once we've filled the cells up, once we've filled the glycogen stores up, if blood glucose is still high, again, that's a potentially life-threatening state. So we have to have some kind of homeostatic response to that to get blood glucose back down within the healthy parameters. The simplest way to do that is to shuttle it to the liver and convert it into something called triglycerides. Triglycerides are a fatty substance that will get stored within the adipose tissue. This happens as a response to the amount of glucose in circulation not the amount of calories now let's just to show you how how ridiculous the calorie picture is as well do you know how calories are measured yes but you can probably Ah, explain that much more eloquently than me so calories are measured by they they're put in a device called a bomb calorimeter that's the one and there it's like a, a little sealed container with a food sample in it and also like a little little wick that's in there that is placed within another container of water and that food is ignited and we measure how much it raises the temperature of that water. And one calorie is raising one kilogram of water by one degree. And that food is burnt to ash. When something's burnt to ash, so you all you got to do is go to like over to the, you know, speak to the, um, like the inorganic chemists, and they'll be like, well, you've just released the energy from every double bond within that, from every bond within that um, substance. That's what you've done. You've just released the energy from all the all the complex bonds in there. Now, 
That in itself is inaccurate information because that is not a representation of how much energy can be liberated within the body. I mean, I've never, I've never had ash come out the other end. <laughs> now, to be fair, I've had a few curries that made me feel like that would happen, but in, you know, in, in actuality, it hasn't. So it goes to show that clearly there's aspects of that food that we don't break down, some of that energy we don't liberate. So already that we, we're working on false information. But even if we were having a lower calorie diet, if there was that much of the glucose in there, we would be triggering those kinds of responses. Now, if we just had a good, balanced, diverse whole foods diet, whole grains, healthy proteins, loads of veg, good amount of fruit, then we're creating an environment where our blood glucose is drip fed. When blood glucose is drip fed, Firstly, none of those things that I spoke about happened, but something very important happens. Insulin is lowered. Now, when insulin is lowered and there's not a huge amount of blood glucose around, we're able to tap into fat stores because when, when um, insulin is high, which will occur when blood glucose is high, that locks the door on the adipocytes. The whole idea of storing this energy is so that we've got some there for later. And when blood glucose comes down and insulin comes down, the, the door on the adipose, the adipose sites, which are the actual fat cells, will open and those fats can come along and we can, we can cleave those fats and we can actually burn those for energy. That's how we survive throughout human evolution. But we need to create an environment for that to happen. And that's what actually is important. Don't get fixated on the number. You have to use more than you store. That's what weight loss is all about. It's not about demanding more of your body and fueling it in, a, in an ever, ever decreasingly adequate way. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? It's, it's a subtle difference. And this is why so many people go wrong. I mean, I've worked with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of patients in clinic that have followed the calorie counting model and they've never been able to have any sustainable weight loss we actually get them to forget all of that crap just like do the right the right kind of activity compose their diet in the right way and everything changes just, everything changes overnight it's well, not overnight i mean but, but they start to start to see significant difference straight away because they're actually working with their physiology they're understanding how their body works finally and that's what it's all that's that's literally what it's all about it's the hormonal response to the foods that you eat and how it influences multiple aspects of metabolic function that will influence your success in weight loss and that's why we've got such a problem because we're just deli being delivered a very very over simplified message but to be fair a message that would be effective is equally as simple and it's like, just get back to basics. I mean, I, I was, I mean, there's a couple of phrases that I sometimes use. They're bloody cheesy, but I still use them sometimes anyway. One is like, if it ran, swam, grew or flew, then eat it, everything else leave behind. And the other one is real food doesn't contain ingredients. Real food is ingredients. Or the other thing is like, when you go, go to the supermarket and do your shopping, just shop around the outside. If you notice, you look in every supermarket. When you go in there, nine, 99 times out of 100 on the left-hand side, is the fruit and veg along the back is meat fish cheese that kind of stuff yeah and then on the right hand side you've got the red wine i mean what else could you want in the world it's like you've got that yeah, you've, you actually go there but i was thinking is it going to get to the wine <laughs> yeah but you know what you know in all seriousness you look at everything that's in the middle is all the processed crap, all yeah. the stuff that's going to be keeping you fat, keeping you sick, fueling cardiovascular disease, increasing your risk of type 2 diabetes. That's the stuff to avoid. Just get back to basics as best you can. And, you know, just fruit, veg, nuts, seeds, whole grains, fish, meat, bit of dairy, happy days. Yeah. Yeah. Keep it, you know, just eat in the way that like your great great grandparents would have done. No, it's, 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 it's so simple and so hard at the same time. And you know what's funny? I was going to ask you the calorie thing. And then I was going to say, so what is it that we should be looking at then? And I was going to ask you about blood sugar, but there you go. You preempted that very well. We'll so, be in there, yeah. Well, well done you. Um, <laughs> um, 
the, what I've learned um, from so far from being a student of your course, so I've got a couple of modules left. But every single thing I learn ends up being about um, blood sugar management, like you just talked about. I mean, you can't get away from it. You no. can't get away from it. Um, so I know I always like to get to, you know, when we get to the end of these things to talk about what we can do. Well, you've already just said what we can do, eat from the outside. Although I have to say nuts and seeds tend to be kind of in the middle aisles, but, you know, eat from the ends. But um why is it so important what as in you've explained what happens that we can store um extra uh, fat especially around the abdominal area but what kind of main diseases that we see in the uk can be correlated to blood sugar management well if you look at if you look certain i mean certainly before before covid i mean covid just made everything bloody fall apart in terms of like what's putting strain on the health service i mean the health service itself is putting strain on the health service but that's a, a different story um the things that were the biggest burdens were obesity cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes and they're all related to the same thing they're all part of what we call metabolic syndrome uh, and you could probably bring some types of cancers into that as well Metabolic syndrome. So basically, I spoke about how that elevated blood glucose would lead to the production of triglycerides. We know how that obviously increases the risk of gaining weight. But those triglycerides have to be sent to the adipose tissue via the circulatory system, i.e. our blood vessels. Whilst they're in circulation, it sends blood fats up. When triglycerides go up, LDL cholesterol goes up. Now, the, here's a, like another distinction. People always say, oh, LDL, that's the bad one, and HDL, that's the good one. Kind of. Kind of. LDL is the one that is more associated with cardiovascular disease, but it's all got to do with the particle size. Now, LDL can come in lots of different shapes and sizes. If it's like what they call large fluffy LDL, it's just, it's just like clouds drifting past, not causing any problems. But on the other end of the spectrum, if it's what they call small and dense, like tiny, tiny, compact little particles of, of LDL, those are the ones that have a higher atherogenicity, meaning they have a higher potential to actually cause atheroma, the plaque, the damage within the vessel wall. How all of this occurs is like, first, there's oxidative damage to things like cholesterol and triglycerides within our blood vessels. That causes damage to the endothelium. The endothelium is like the skin that lines the inside of the vessel. When that damage to the endothelium occurs, there's like normal repair mechanisms that kick in, the same as if you cut your finger and you get like a scab forming. Same deal. You start to get, get fibrin laid down and you get like a, a lattice, like a crisscross lattice formed over the area of damage. But that lattice, it's a little bit like a net, and it can actually stick out into what we call the lumen, which is the space. So this, the space of the vessel, the lumen, parts of that net can actually stick out into that environment. And the sheer force of like blood and everything being, being pumped through, some of these particles of cholesterol will actually get caught in that and start to become embedded within the vessel wall just by the sheer force of everything move, moving through if those particles are small enough to be able to get in there in the first place. If they're just great big globules, like the large fluffy, they'll just kind of ooze around it and carry on on their, on, on their way doing the important job that cholesterol does, i.e. creating all of our sex hormones and cell membranes and things like that. But these small, dense particles, because they're small enough to actually penetrate the space between like the endothelial cells and some of the smooth muscle cells, just the other side of the endothelium, they can, and they start to get embedded there. Once they become embedded there, the immune system realizes there's some kind of infiltration and attack going on. So the immune system responds, and then those certain white cells of the immune system will burrow in there and start to engulf those small, dense LDL particles, when that happens, those immune cells then turn into something called a foam cell. That's when you start getting the fatty streaks in the vessel wall. And then muscle cells start to grow over it, and it is a full-on plaque, and that is heart disease. Okay, so that's, that's the first one. Elevated blood glucose 
and blood sugar spikes will actually trigger the formation of small, dense LDL particles. So LDL goes up, but the particle size is smaller and denser, which means greater atherogenicity. And then with type 2 diabetes, if we're eating a diet that's constantly pushing blood glucose up all of the time, and we're constantly in that high state, and there's just huge amounts of insulin being released all the time because our blood sugar is constantly being carpet bombed, then after a while, again, homeostasis is going to kick in. Some of the things, there's something called receptor dynamics, which takes place. It's where receptors are intelligent and they respond to their environment. So if all of a sudden, I mean, this, this happens a lot with, um, you know, with things like the menopause, when there's a consistently, consistently longer period of time where estrogen is low, one of the things that the body will do is actually produce more estrogen receptors so that there's more of a chance that one of the receptors will bind to what's there. So it's like, like going fishing and like putting more, more baits out in the water. The more you put out there, the more chance you've got of, of, of having a bite. Same deal. But then on the, on the flip side of that, the more a hormone or a ligand, so anything that binds to a receptor is called a ligand, the more of, of that that there is in circulation, the opposite will happen. Receptors will downregulate, so the amount of those receptors available will start to go down. This is one of the first things that happens when we're, for a prolonged period of time, eating this very, very high glycemic diet. High glycemic meaning a diet that floods blood glucose, sends it up really high really quickly and causes this whole alarm cascade. We'll start to get downregulation of um, insulin receptors. Then if this still carries on, those receptors that are there will kind of think, hang on, I think insulin's maybe, you know, lost his mind a little bit. I'm going to ignore him. He's definitely not right. He's a wrong one. He's a wrong one. I'm going to pay no attention whatsoever. Well, a little bit of attention. Now and again, now and again, I'll give him a chance. But most of the time, I'm going to ignore him. That's when we move into insulin resistance, where insulin just isn't able to do the job that it was doing before. Because that happens, less of that glucose is being taken up by the cells. So we get in even higher levels of triglycerides. We get in even more weight gain, but also we've still got huge amounts of glucose in circulation and that starts to cause damage to different tissues. One tissue that's particularly susceptible to that are the beta cells of the pancreas. They can be damaged by glucotoxicity and bingo, we've got type two diabetes, which can be reversed effectively by the way. And you can see how that, that elevated glucose is related to all of those conditions. And it is a triad of conditions that we call metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome is the disease of modern living. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, oh, I'm just uh, sweating from keeping up with your train of thought here, <laughs> trying to, trying to, yeah, I know, but I'm, I'm pleased I understood it all. It's all good. It's all good. And it, I've, I've even read, and I don't know where your take is on this, because I'm, I'm also going to wrap up because I have a school run to do, but, um, but, but some people are also calling things like dementia type three diabetes. Yeah. The reason for that is, um, because those, those cells, those, those bundles of neurons that are affected by amyloid plaque, are actually less able to use glucose as a fuel source. So that's where they're kind of giving it that nickname from. However, those, those neurons can perfectly use ketone bodies as a fuel source. So there's a lot of research being done now that's delivering some incredible results. People uh, are getting, you know, when they're being able to do it under clinical supervision, so the only food available is fit in a very strict ketogenic diet and a, keto, a, a true ketogenic diet needs to be 70 percent of calories from fat very hard to do on a day-to-day -day basis unless you're in somewhere that's able to monitor your food but to get into true nutritional ketosis that's what you've got to do um when they're getting into nutritional ketosis and the, their body's using ketones these people have got their relatives back they're back in the room like those faculties are back all of those affected neurons just start firing up again. But as soon as the diet changes and they start becoming um, like more glucose dependent, then, you know, they start going downhill again. So it's certainly fascinating the, the, the research that's coming through now. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I was reading the same things and it's, it, it is truly fascinating. Listen, I've been asked to ask you a few questions because, okay. um, because um, 
knowing all the things you know now, I guess the assumption is from a lot of people that, oh, you, your diet must be perfect all the time, or, you know, you know exactly what to do at all times, and you always, because, this, I mean, to see some of the food you're cooking and showing on your Instagram, I'm like, wow, I'm right on that train to wherever you live, and I want to eat some of that food, it looks amazing, but what are your downfalls, where do you, where do you fail? Um, they've, they've been in different ways at different times, I mean, I've had, I've had all sorts of, um, journeys over the years I struggled with alcohol at one point in my life um, and ended up having to sort of you know get some considerable amount of help for that um, diet you know what the diet thing is is such a habit for me now that I never really f- sort of go off I mean sometimes I change things up a little bit if I if I'm being more active or if I'm just getting bored or whatever but what I've I think my my biggest things now, you know, because all those other issues, they're in the past. But now, I would say seeking other interests and other things in my life outside my work. Yeah. Yeah. And that includes kind of spiritual connection as well, because I, I was a practicing Buddhist, like when I was in my 20s. And I'd still, if, if anyone was to ask me what, what my... Uh, religious proclivities would be I would I would say I would class myself as a Buddhist but I don't go to a temple and stuff anymore I kind of miss that and I I miss there being that that side of life where I was I was more engaged with uh, you know the spiritual aspects of my life and it's you know it was a huge part of of my life for so long but then just got so embedded in work and the amount of stuff that I had to do that um, I kind of lost that connection a little bit so that that's one um what's stopping you though from getting that back well i don't know i don't know i just i my work is like is all consuming yeah. sometimes maybe, maybe it's you stopping you yeah probably, well, you reckon yeah probably um <laughs> this, this is the thing I, and yeah i don't know and, uh, mm. these are the kind of questions that we obviously we have to ask ourselves don't we yeah. if we and have those honest conversations with ourselves it's like right okay well yeah where is the block what is what is what is the issue? Yeah. Um, it's really easy to tell the people listening what to do, but then actually telling yourself what to do and following your own advice can be tricky sometimes. You know sometimes. what? That's one That's one thing I never do. Hmm. Right? You know, and um, I, I guess, I, I guess, like, you know, can we compared to Gandhi for that, because he never did that. I mean, it's not just a bald head. Um, <laughs> you know, the, it was it was said, um, teach what you embody and embody what you teach. And if someone was saying, oh, like, you know, what should I do for this? And I, I hadn't, being able to deal with that or address that in my life, I would say so. But, but I would also say, okay, let's figure it out together because I, I want to get get over this and, and figure this out as well. So, you know, let's be a resource for each other. That's what that's kind of how I would approach it. But that's the one thing that I would never do. I would never actually sit there and preach at people for things that I would never do myself. No. That's a sure no. fact. Uh, Although because... it's, 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 it's easier, easy, isn't it, to, to know when somebody comes to you with a problem. I often find myself sharing my thoughts on it and then going two seconds later hang on I, I might as well be telling myself this because I I you know I need to be learning xyz as well so it's interesting yeah. and, but that goes back to I guess community and spirituality and having a mm. connection with people which we seem which we need to get back I think um for from you know having lost that the last couple of years um I also got a question and actually that's this might be quite interesting um so there was a lot about food but also when do you recognize that you need a break? When I can barely get out of bed. That's another, that's another thing that I, that I uh, tend to do. I tend to just go and 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 then yeah. hit the deck completely yeah. knackered. Um, usually, usually I start to get a sore throat. My throat's always been my Achilles heel all the way through my life. So I start to get a sore throat and you know and feel really really fatigued i'm like i've done it again right okay and I'll, but you know what I'll, I'll rest up for a few days and then then i'm back in the game usually um also when i when things that normally make me happy get up my nose like so you know whenever it gets to the point where the day-to-day tasks of doing my work are just like oh, for fuck's sake i just can't be bothered um or like an email comes through it's like bugger off do you know what i mean when it's like that it's just like you need to separate yourself a little bit and i guess that kind of links to what i was saying before about like having other interests and other things outside of um 
my work. But when it gets like that, it's like, <laughs> yeah, you need a bit of a time out. And it always does with the world, world of good. Yeah, yeah, um, I think we all do that. We, but, but, but don't you think there's a bit of a society around us that we're always supposed to be delivering and producing and doing and hustling and you all You know what? Things? I'm really strict with that kind of stuff now. I mean, like with, with email, for example, and like this is this is like the kind of uh, Tim Ferriss thing, okay? My email, I check it twice a day. I check it at 9 a.m. and I check it at 3. If you email me after 3, you're getting dealt with tomorrow. And you can either you can either like it or lump it, but that's how it's going to work. Um, and so it's something like, how can you do that? It's like, well, otherwise, you're building your entire day around other people's demands and needs. Yeah. And like, you know, one, that's going to send your blood pressure up. Two, it's going to affect your productivity big time. Um, I, I divide my day into, um, into, into different tasks. I do sort of three hours on content, two hours on web upkeep da, 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 kind of like build it like that and if you've got your email open all the time and you're constantly replying you can guarantee that's not going to happen and when you're when you're juggling so many so many plates and trying to do so many things yourself you've got to be absolutely super strict with that kind of stuff yeah love it yeah i've got something to learn there definitely i'm much too available and i think the other thing it can lead to is to resentment towards those people who actually oh, yeah. get a much nicer response from you if you listen like, and <laughs> for a little bit yeah 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 uh, believe me that is the case as well <laughs> yeah exactly exactly yeah. oh gosh there's so much more i could ask you because i, I think it's, i think it is so so good to have somebody um like you to follow on instagram the other person i have to uh d- d- share that also i think shares uh, with le- less nutrition advice but more sort of like simple meals that we all can do is um i think some of you know james y and yes. uh, yeah, james, is great. james and i think it's so important to have people who are just going like look it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be hard it doesn't have to be complicated it doesn't have to be goji berries all day <laughs> this is what you can do to actually set yourself up for a really good day and um, this is what those ingredients will do for you and um just really practical advice so so thank you for that because i think it's it can all be so complicated sometimes yeah. And I've certainly gone into that trap of overcomplicating things. And then the upkeep is just impossible. Oh, yeah. And I think I think everyone kind of goes through that when they first discover wellness yeah. and the, the passion starts to ignite. Yeah. They'll, they'll start going down every rabbit hole. But most people always find their way back to like, you know what, just keep it simple. Yeah. Just build it around whole foods. Keep it simple create food that you're going to enjoy and that's 95 percent of the battle won and then we've got five percent of our own unique kind of genetic quirks that, that might mean that we need a little tweak of something here and there or a little bit more of this or a little bit less of that um but that's so unimportant in the grand scheme of things yeah it's keeping it simple yeah exactly no thank you so much for for being a voice of reason and i i can't mm. recommend your books enough honestly whenever i look up whenever i wonder something i get my nutrition bible out <laughs> it's one of the best i got it for christmas one of the best books ever I go hang on what is this good for again and um no it's it's so handy um but we, we that's that's more for my research i think because i talk to my children now about color and how many colors can you have on your plate and why would this be a really good thing for you mm. to try you don't have to like it but give it a go and see how it makes you feel and little by little small steps right you create uh, a healthier lifestyle healthier habits and absolutely yeah and that can only be good for 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 yourself and it allows you to do more for your family to those around you I mean I'm certainly a much nicer person to be around if I feel myself uh in a good way and if right. I move and and take time out to rest and all of those things so it can only be a good thing for everyone else Listen, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been it's been really, really lovely having you on. And on a personal note as well, thank you for all the advice on on allergies that you gave me in a Facebook Live not too long ago, because we are eating reishi mushroom powder on our breakfast cereal every morning. And And is it working? Well, it's hard to tell because it could be that that pollen strain has gone, but my daughter is no longer suffering. So that is mm-hmm. interesting news indeed. So uh, the cat allergy is still there, but that's... Uh, oh, that's- see, I, would, I wouldn't be able to handle that because I'm an absolute 
complete cat person like yeah. cat ob- obsessed yeah. um, so that would just be the worst thing in the world that could happen to me is get a cat allergy you're yeah like, oh. i know i know i love cats and i've developed a bit of an allergy as well so we we have one of those fancy fluffy hypoallergenic dogs instead so well we don't react to it so <laughs> a hypoallergenic the- dog <laughs> He's the cutest little rascal you'll ever meet. So um, is it like like a, like a genetic modification or what? I mean, what, yeah. How, wow. Well, I don't know, but it seems to do the trick. So a reishi mushroom powder all the way. So thank you so much for that. That is a fancy ingredient, but for the rest of the advice you're giving, it's so it's so easy and mm. so accessible. Thank you so much, Dale, for being on. And, it's a pleasure. Um, we'll see you in the, after the summer holidays, I guess. Absolutely, yeah. And I'll see if I can crack on a little bit for my studies now for uh, for my diploma. Looking up, I have all my reference books up there. Oh, amazing. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Take Pleasure. care now. You've been listening to the Small Steps to Wellness show with Mari Craig. I am passionate about helping mums get their energy back through simple nutritional changes. Because we know that if mummy is happy, the family is happy. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Instagram under at Small Steps to Wellness or visit my website, smallstepstowellness.info. Speak to you soon.